So um, main focus was is going to be in that a bit more technical aspect that has to do with auditing accessibility and how complex can be and and because my PhD was on MOOCs, so we're going to see several examples that are based on that. Although definitions, I've tried to make them more open uh, to all online content. Uh, as well, we are going to be talking about and discussing options such as uh, um, what's the, the involvement of stakeholders in this process of accessibility, and hopefully have some time to discuss together uh, before you go for lunch. Uh, some of the, some of uh, of, uh, of you uh, to help. So. I think it's kind of like uh, interesting that uh, uh, back in June 2017, uh, so yeah, kind of a five years uh, anniversary, uh, six years indeed, we were um, uh, having one of the uh, reading groups uh, with a paper uh, that is named uh, Embedding Accessibility and Usability Considerations for Learning, Research and Development Projects from uh, colleagues uh, uh, Martin, Ted and Anne. And uh, when uh, reading the paper and thinking about some of the concluding comments and and uh, just going to read aloud, we argue that accessibility, usability and pedagogic issues are all interrelated in a learning context. Accessibility and usability issues need to be addressed through a project life cycle to ensure its developments are subsequently adopted in educational delivery. Educate evaluations are key to ensuring accessibility and usability issues have been addressed in projects developments. As well, uh, we believe that integrating accessibility and usability evaluations yields distinct benefits over treating them as separate areas for study. So this was valid in 2007. This is valid. This was valid when we had the group in 17. This is valid uh, nowadays. So some, somehow this is the uh, when teaching and having to do with the software development uh, reflection that comes every time is that, OK, accessibility is there. How much we actually have changed? How actually uh, can actually say that I couldn't use the same claim in uh, in most of uh, papers that have to do with accessibility nowadays? Going back to 2015, and one of the the first thing that I actually realized when when doing my my PhD as well had to do as well with uh, um, aspect of accessibility had to do, and because of the importance of MOOCs at that time had a quite uh, uh, a visibility. So there was this uh, 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 settlement between the National Association of the Deaf in the US and edX in order to provide accurate captioning for the deaf and adapting basically the content from, from MOOCs provided by edX platform. Uh, so, so one sentence from the settlement, uh, and I think quite embraced the, the aspect of uh, how uh, I think uh, openness can support and and can benefit accessibility is that uh, these online courses have the potential to increase access to high quality education for people facing income, distance, and other barriers, but only if they are truly open to everyone. Uh, this uh, agreement is far reaching in ensuring that individuals with disabilities will have an equal opportunity to independently and currently access quality higher education online. On the other hand, I think if I remember correctly, I have the date here, a couple of years later, uh, Berkeley decided to, in a similar situation, not to afford. Uh, making the content provided accessible in the uh, University of California, and they decided to basically uh, require users to have credentials to access that content. So closing the content, uh, closing access to uh, everyone for those resources. So kind of another perspective, I think something to think about how accessibility was dealing to context. So the definition, uh, I think, uh, trying to cover accessibility in, in online courses uh, could be something like this, I propose. So accessibility is the ability of the online course environment to adjust to the needs of all learners and is determined by the flexibility of the platform with respect to presentation, access modality, and learner support, and the availability of adequate alternative but equivalent educational resources and assignments. All learners can use online courses in a range of contexts of use, including mainstream and assistive technologies. To achieve these online courses need to be designed and developed to consider technical and learning design aspects to support usability across this context. So it's a bit of the idea that uh, accessibility, and when we're going to be talking about auditing accessibility, moves a bit uh, and needs to be discussed outside uh, the, the definition of web accessibility and uh, accessibility 
uh, and in general accessibility is a practice for making information activities and an environment sensible, meaningful, and usable for as many people as possible. So there is that relationship between accessibility and usability, but accessibility has to do a lot with equity, uh, inclusive cultural practice, uh, people, compliance, and the context as well. So quality and and the circumstances. And we are going to be seeing that when we discuss about how to audit or ideas to audit accessibility. Um, a simple uh, audit will look like uh, something like this, and this is a very simple uh, six steps approach, but basically summarize the process. You always have to select a sample within what you want to evaluate. In this case, web pages. Imagine we have a run course, so we might like to select some from the platform and some from the course itself. Uh, so assess the sample, uh, six uh, uh, classic uh, VCAC examples, and also about accessibility or technical accessibility might have been like disable images and check they have alternative text. Uh, you have disabled sound and check uh, um, textual alternatives. The font size can be changed, uh, screen resolution, scroll. You can scroll down uh, and you don't need to scroll down for ages or how it works. Uh, check color contrast and how to access with uh, keyboard and different resources. So. As well, just different tools to support you. So um, you can use voice, the browser, you can use uh, automatic evaluation tools. But the important thing is that you have to record all those results to, to give them back to uh, to yourself, to your client, whoever uh, is going to be uh, take the benefits of, of that uh, audit. But as well, as well it's, it's relevant to think that there are two key aspects when, when dealing with the uh, audits on accessibility. So we have the expert. Who's going to be running an heuristic evaluation? Who's going to be doing that manual evaluation of the of the sample provided? And but that doesn't need to be done alone. There are many tools that can support you through that process. And just one example using uh, Wave, which is uh, a plugin on on Chrome. Uh, just checking the, the website from the Guardian yesterday. So you can you can very easily support your evaluation uh, using tools like this, like we'll tell you the problems in contrast, uh, different features that might need but manual evaluation because the tool cannot determine itself what's going on. Uh, problems related to the structure of the content, so screen reader might be able to go through or not, and uh, different errors that the tool marks itself as uh, blocking accessibility. So the first case study we are going to be seeing today has to do with my PhD and is an accessibility audit developed uh, to be run against uh, four MOOCs and with four different aspects. And going uh, behind those boundaries of accessibility and thinking about different aspects to cover that don't necessarily have only to be focused on the technical aspects. So it's a well about thinking, well, obviously, uh, the conformance to guidelines and standards on the web, so BCAC guidelines. And uh, in that case, I included some analysis on, on text based files. We are going to see all the four components a bit more in detail, not much, not want to want to be very, very technical technical presentation. And the user experience. So in this this case, uh, going through the evaluation uh, using uh, usability and user experience characteristics but uh, using cognitive and user experience wall throws. For that purpose, uh, you simulate the same situation uh, with personas uh, created from another study, so they are real personas, uh, or they are named real personas, although uh, are just, uh, we'll see later, uh, a way to evaluate. And um, quality evaluation, uh, said before, aspects that might be influencing the accessibility through uh, poor quality of the content. Uh, those are based in, uh, in Open Up ED initiative and the learning design. So there's another core aspect. I think, in my opinion, one and four kind of like the ones that after running this, this study in my PSD kind of uh, 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 got more attention on how to uh, in, improve them. No? And uh, what well, evaluating the learning uh, design characteristics in this case using a framework yeah. known as universal design for learning. So I think now what this is quite well known. So to do that, uh, I'm trying to avoid to evaluate in a just no uh, 
uh, checkbox, try to add a bit more of granularity. So first of all, trying to provide the evaluator with the set of, uh, of, uh, of characteristics to apply when evaluating. So everyone that is applying the same uh, checklist can, can use the what to test for. So to know uh, what the criterion is evaluating, in this case, I, I copy and paste. It's about the expert, not the student. The testing method, as well to 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 see exactly what to test, and um, the the way to evaluate it is kind of like a five options uh, scale. No? Uh, maybe it's, uh, maybe is not applicable, which in this case uh, was encouraged to use the comments. Uh, and then as well, uh, the future is test to missing, so not achieved. The future to test is available, but not integrated. So it's partially achieved. So what we are looking for is there, but it's not well integrated. The future to test is available, but partially integrated. So we got the positive, slightly positive side, so largely achieved. And the future to test is available and fully integrated. So basically that's one done. And we can see just two examples in the case of uh, of the keyboards that we said before. So are all our controls operable with a keyboard and the way you can uh, do that to, to check it out. And the sample try to cover uh, providers from different, uh, well, actually uh, four different kind of big providers with different uh, type of courses. So one from physical sciences, one from education, one from mathematical sciences and one from biological science as well to, to try to find out and try to test the tool and see uh, how useful it is to evaluate accessibility. Uh, it's important to say that the audit itself was validated uh, with um, five experts. Uh, they uh, I evaluated, did all evaluations and had meetings with different experts that evaluated the same course with the same uh, checklist from each of the four uh, pieces of the audit itself. And well, we can see that uh, there is quite a lot of moderate agreement. So we start to see how difficult it can be from two people expert in the area to evaluate, even using the same uh, sample and the same uh, criteria. So going through the first part of 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 the audits, the first component, uh, well, just to uh, define. Uh, definition provided of uh, web content accessibility guidelines. They try to cover a wide range of recommendations for making web content more accessible. Uh, following these guidelines will make content more accessible to a wider range of people with disabilities. And these guidelines address accessibility of web content on desktop, laptop, tablets, and mobile devices. And as well, following these guidelines will also often make web content more usable to all users. So that the definition brings the the aspect of, of usability with accessibility and how accessibility improves uh, the use of every uh, user. And obviously, that's a definition uh, for everything, for every type of web content. Nothing that needs to be focused on education and has uh, four key uh, principles. And added a, a fifth one uh, for the purpose of the research. But we have to take care that the site must provide test alternatives. Alternatives for maintain bias media, and well, uh, all, first uh, principle is to make sure all content is easy to see and hear. Uh, the second one is uh, as well is more about operability. So provide keyboard access and enough time to read, adjust content, orientation, clear navigation, and the content is organized and uh, understandable. And this already we'll see has some overlaps with the things that we can consider in educational context. So readable, consistent, predictable instructions must be clear. And robust, so compatibility with different user agents and assistive technologies, user agents meaning uh, basically web browsers. And yeah, uh, because of the content of the courses as well, uh, some accessibility tests should be run on, uh, on files. In this case, in many cases, we are providing PDF files. And here I just picked up some examples, just not to make it very in detail, but I think the important aspect is to see the variability and to see how different courses are providing different uh, compliance and, and as well uh, how in some cases they are providing no compliance at all. 
So for example, we can see that the, the headings and labels were working very well. And, and first, I would like to analyze this is just an uh, example of research, not meaning that the platforms are not accessible. Um, although probably you can say that most of them aren't that accessible as we think. But um, if we think about as well, aspects such as contracts, which is kind of uh, can be very important and vital. Uh, none of the platforms and the courses analyzed were, were following it. It was difficult for some for audio description. And if we think about understandable principles that might be a bit more linked with the educational context as well, uh, the, the use of abbreviations, pronunciations, how to suggest, uh, how to approach errors, and the use of unusual words wasn't really contemplated. And just to see it visually, so we can see that in it, the differences between some of the principles, some of the principles were more achieved than others. And we can see big differences, in, for example, in understable, when we see quite a lot are fully achieved, but quite a lot of them as well are not being achieved at all. In terms of uh, thinking about the second part, so the user experience, and I think uh, the idea was to try to cover different common situations when access to to the courses in this case again MOOC. So how to how to access the um, the registration and and sending uh, processes um, as well. Uh, check if in educational resources learners uh, uh, can interact with different formats of uh, multimedia content uh, as well with the, with the different files as well. How students who are working together who could be working. On discussions, assignments, or 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 tests. Uh, an example of how to report help when needed, which is something that uh, is very important when when you cannot really continue and find a barrier. How the platform is supporting that, and well, general things about uh, the the workload and how the organization of content and syllabus can be affecting that persona. So before personas are, uh, and we can see example and the top right are based on real people I interview, uh, but obviously have been anonymized and, and, and some of the conditions have been just made up for the process of auditing uh, accessibility and in this case user experience. So uh, Marta, we have some, some information so we can put ourselves in the, in the context of the, which experience in future learn as a, quite a lot of interest and, and well, uh, for example, Marta doesn't like uh, uh, doing peer review exercises and usually skips them. And, but uh, well, uh, as well the scenario. So uh, with uh, Marta particular needs, she generally uses a Windows Magnifier, a screen reader. So we, we are going to be using those tools uh, when we are going to be running our uh, scenarios. And, and we can see as well examples of how that works when doing it. So. If we go through Martha, it probably makes sense. Uh, in the search, well, uh, there are options at the beginning, which is good. Otherwise, I need to scroll down, uh, and the screen readers needs time to reach the searching area. So you can actually find some sort of idea using the different personas and consider that uh, is not very well addressed in that case. As well, as I said before, uh, we can see different platforms and different providers are offering. Uh, different uh, results to the audit. Uh, for example, in terms of, of design, we can see uh, it's quite quite a difference, but in general terms, we can find some things have been uh, addressed, some others aren't. It's kind of like we really never see something like it's really fully achieved uh, or not achieved at all. There is always some imbalance between, between providers. The third part, when we think about the, the the quality, and I kind of think that one this one was a bit of experimental because we might agree uh, that after running the audit, some of the aspects weren't that much related to accessibility, but that's something to be tested. But uh, I think more important about this, the two and, and third one, so quality of design. So are you considering different areas groups uh, and how those things actually uh, it's important to 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 stress that uh, that in the information to check, it was most oriented to 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 think about how that involves accessibility aspects uh, than the definition itself. But um, as well, uh, I think quite important uh, is the third one, 
so the support for learners so how the platform and access to the the learners after to the learning environment and, and how that is uh, influencing as well in terms of for example asking for help again we can see uh, and, and thinking about um, for example uh, is not providing any learning pathways uh, information about prior knowledge is missing and uh, as well well uh, thinking about uh, options to provide to ask and raise your hand for help uh, this is kind of nice at least two platforms were, were fully achieving that and, and instructions to to for feedback uh, and well interaction with other social networks which is something that necessarily not need to be there but if it is there at least it would be good if it follows not quality in terms of accessibility in this case uh, uh, quality was quite uh, uh, well achieved uh, by the indicators and then we go to the uh, to the learning design which by the way sorry I think I just wanted to include this this slide before the previous one um, universal design for learning is a technical approach that works to accommodate the needs and abilities of all learners and eliminates unnecessary hardness in the learning process this means developing a flexible learning environment in which information is presented in multiple ways, students engage in learning in a variety of ways, and students are provided options when demonstrating their learning. So, tries to bring a framework uh, to think about uh, how to make content uh, universally accessible. And we can argue if that's the correct approach or not, but at least it offers an opportunity to think a lot and, and reflect about aspects that have to do with the learning design, which is fantastic in terms of of evaluating the, uh, the accessibility. So uh, UDL has three main principles, uh, multiple means of engagement. Uh, so as well, it's necessary to offer options that reflect their interests, so le students and learners interests, and strategies to face new tasks, choices for supervision and reflection uh, on their expectations. So adding that option of, of personalization and uh, uh, for, the, for the learner. As well, multiple means of representations. So information uh, can be understood in different ways. So diff offer different options to approach contents through various channels of perception. As well, provide information in a format that allows being used by the learner. And finally, uh, multiple means of uh, for action and expression. Uh, learners might differ uh, how they are working in the learning process. Uh, so it's necessary to offer options for for actions through educational resources with which all learners can interact with and then i'm going back to this one so when applying the the learning design uh, it is was proved to be quite difficult because yeah uh how to there is a bit of a bit of overlap in between of some of the of the criteria and we're going to see a study focus on on udl in in a couple of minutes but okay uh, thinking about the different ways of uh, of uh, providing information, uh, providing alternatives for auditory information, visual information, the use of vocabulary, and well, promote understanding across languages, uh, illustrate through multiple media. So we can see the variety of solutions that uh, that some of the providers are are offering and how uh, it's quite different. And I think that's one of the interesting things when doing these exercises and auditing is that we can actually uh, flag. Uh, differences and, and think about those so as well well um, they were failing in, in providing goal setting on planning and strategy development so that's that's kind of interesting as well to think about some things that we might think that have to be clear uh, from the beginning maybe uh, are in that uh, that went design well uh, in this case uh, depends on courses quite a lot, but in general, results are more into the red orange area. And well, that's the point. Some of the powerful things uh, is the visual, the visual aspects of, of the final resource. One of the things I'm trying to do now is, is trying to uh, develop uh, uh, some sort of, of uh, 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 dashboard when uh, information can be seen in different formats and so a bit more uh, of a statistical aspects and compare evaluations to the same resource by different experts which is kind of the the, the key area uh, to think about so these four MOOCs were analyzed by me uh, for my PhD uh, 
and what to do next. No, so just some reflection about the audit itself. So there is a quite. If we think about the time it needs to be run, it's really incredible. Maybe just evaluating the four courses could take a, uh, easily more than one week of work. Uh, because you need to, to center, you need to prepare everything, you need to uh, think about the personas and, and the different context. Um, and there is an overlap between criteria, and that's good because uh, different companies of the audit might be evaluating right. the same thing. Uh, but that's actually useful to, to flag differences between, between evaluations. Uh, strengths, so the four components are coming from four different theories behind, so uh, there might be more uh, strict, more relaxed, uh, inconsistency between uh, uh, criteria. So some of the findings might be contradictory. That actually is interesting itself. So how to solve that? And complementarity. So comments can be complementary and, and help to, to think about and find uh, ideas to improve accessibility. Uh, so what about next have to do with the technical aspects? Think about uh, how to improve the analysis of those. Uh, what about UDL? Uh, what about actually uh, involving uh, stakeholders in, in these processes? So case uh, study number two, uh, this was an idea of just take the first component of the audit and adapt it to, to a module at UNET uh, in computer engineering course that uh, about disability and accessibility. So we need to consider students have been trained on using the guidelines and they are all evaluating the same resource. So it was very interesting to check the level of agreement of training students using VCAC. And as well, some open-ended questions to think about how automatic evaluation tools that we have seen that can be handy for evaluation were perceived by them and how they were supporting their analysis. So during two years, this was run and included an example of 63 students, which is very interesting to get 63 people evaluating the same resource. I'm only including the first principle in, in the images. Uh, all of them uh, uh, obviously were evaluated, but um, there were two criteria here included. So if we remember correctly, uh, the options to evaluate were uh, uh, five, so basically it, it wasn't complete, achieved at all, not achieved, partial achieved. It wasn't uh, contemplated in, in the course as option, so it's missing. On it was largely or fully achieved. So uh, we had a kappa for the uh, for five values and then a simplified kappa for three values. So just not achieved, uh, it isn't uh, there and fully achieved. And uh, so, and then the representation of fair agreement uh, is with an asterisk and a moderate substantial and perfect agreements with a plus. Uh, if we have a look to a table at the bottom, we can see that um, agreements uh, were uh, mostly in the fair and moderate side. And, uh, and we have to really simplify K2 to find uh, more substantial agreements. Uh, this is a proof. And, in, and, and we claim actually in the literature, uh, experts in the area, uh, different experts, different experts might have different criteria, even having the same instructions. And okay. so basically 65 of success criteria in BCAC do not reach 80% of agreement among writers confirming the complicity of VCAC conformance. So how we can actually trust the experts that are evaluating accessibility if we might reach different results. When asked students about their uh, the use of tools and compared to manual evaluation, well, uh, automatic tools can be used many times and they are very supportive. They are always available. Uh, the manual evaluation is 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 uh, more difficult to generate false positives. We might claim that's not really completely true following the previous slide, but. As well, reviewers provide greater detail and reliability regarding the problems detected. That's totally true. But I mean, in general terms, you are using them both. Uh, some problems of the tools is that uh, many criteria they cannot evaluate, uh, so you need to use the the expert and require complex uh, interpretation. Uh, so that might bring to false positives as well. And when thinking about manual evaluation, well, the reviews will uh, have a greater periodicity and automatic reviews. That's a common. 
uh, it might not be the case because we might be changing the content and what's going to happen with, with accessibility in, in we're just using an agile approach. That's going to be handy because we should be reviewing time to time. But if, we, if something goes live and doesn't have any test, we might be changing things and we don't check accessibility. Again, it's something one of the first uh, things that usually are not checked when, when in a RAS. So, um, as well, some aspects are difficult to more light. So, kind of like, okay, we, we really need uh, many times uh, uh, an assistive tool to really test something or um, aspects that have, might need to go through the code are complicated to simulate. So um, again, about um, about 86% of the criteria are marked as not being correctly addressed by automatic tools, with an overlap of those showing false positives, and 25 criteria are indicated as difficult to evaluate manually, so basically one third of them. Just to say this was updated to VCAC 2.1, which is an upgraded version from the one just in the first case study. And the, the other case study that has to do with the audit, the audit itself is uh, again UDL. So how UDL claims that uh, while using it and, and you inter interiorize it and uh, you become an expert learner. So you are able to make your own decisions. Uh, the idea here is was to, to become a bit more of an expert evaluator. No? If you are uh, evaluating the courses following UDL, you might be more critic and uh, you might as well decide what is being addressed or not in terms of, of uh, universal design for learning. So yeah, we have seen before the three main principles, but as, at the bottom we can say, we can see, sorry, that uh, when you are understand those principles, you might become an expert, motivated, uh, resourceful or goal-directed, for example. Uh, we can claim that that's kind of tricky and that cannot be applied to everyone. But with that idea was to use and adapt that part of the audit that can be a bit tricky to be used just by default. In, uh, in a project that basically is similar to um, one of these uh, platforms that uh, have plenty of, of courses, like uh, Class Central, MOOCLIS, Talk, and uh, so students can, can join the platform and add feedback, but adding the evaluation using UDL. So UDL was the framework to evaluate those courses and, and see how the information that could be used uh, was missing. With the idea, this is if this goes massive. Uh, all that feedback can be very handy for uh, for the providers and and obviously for research purposes to understand uh, what's going on. The other side of it, obviously, is the potential for students to find the courses they are trying, uh, they are looking for, and they fulfill their needs, which is uh, relevant. This is just a screen, screenshot. Uh, sorry for the the text side, but basically. On the right hand, we can see the evaluations that are are following the audit in a in a in a different uh, way, just asking directly the question, but if pressing the plus, quite a lot of information on how to run the evaluation was was included. Obviously, uh, we are thinking about making learners evaluate 31 criteria, so that's not very practical. But in terms of research purposes, we were trying to understand and why not to apply something similar. In this case, only in one course with a smaller sample of 33 students to use the platform to evaluate and understand uh, how they are finding and how they agree uh, when using the UDL evaluation framework and the perceptions they might have when using, uh, when using it. And just saying the students are training BCAC, but not training UDL. So it's a kind of different situation than before. Uh, so basically, uh, the results were very diverse, and if statistics were, uh, if where they were put in the previous example, they were even more here. So, 14 out of 31 checkpoints where at least one student disagreed, indicating the course did not complement the UDL checkpoint. Uh, from of the 14 checkpoints with disagreement evaluations, 11 of those had a slight agreement using K1. So remember, using just the five, the, the five uh, scores, whereas six. Uh, had a slight agreement using uh, the simplified version. So, um, 
prioritizing those six as like agreement checkpoints with a compass or checkpoints with at least 10% of students with disagreement in evaluations. And when students were asked about using uh, the tools themselves and, and how they feel uh, doing this exercise in comparison when running BCAC, well, students said that uh, BCAC are more oriented to the correction based on the staging of the content and to the variety of tools and the good use of them. Uh, well, without presenting errors in the implementation, uh, it's more oriented to you, to the users to access. While UDL is a methodology that values more conceptually the mechanisms that promote learning and make it more open to a greater number of people. Well, it was found difficult to evaluate by some of the students. So the checkpoints, uh, in this case, the, the, the criteria where, where it is assessed, whether the proposed activities agree with what they deserve to learn, are difficult to assess. So it's in the end, it's a very personal point of view of the student. In the same case, the level of difficulty of the MOOC activities, the feedback in the test, and the existence of questions that help reflection. And about reflect redundancy. So the different questions about the language could unify it. And uh, in general terms, I think it was about the 31 uh, checkpoints seem a lot. And we kind of think about how to simplify them. On the other hand, we can think, OK, we really want to know everything and had that redundancy we were saying before it might not be necessarily a bad thing when running an expert evaluation 11 checkpoints were difficult to evaluate uh, by by students in the course and 18 were considered redundant and well there were five checkpoints and intersection of difficult to evaluate and redundancy and well quite a lot of ambiguity etc Let's think about, and I'm aware of time as well, let's think about um, a bit of reverse engineering. So what I've been presenting in the first case study was a study sheet from my PhD. Um, what about the views of different uh, stakeholders? And, and thinking only about research question three, which basically was covering the three studies, how can MOOCs be made accessible for learners with accessibility needs? Uh, what were the views of, of, for example, those providers, or what were the views of learners themselves? So just very briefly, 26 uh, experts, uh, sorry, providers and um, some actually expert researchers in the area of MOOCs were, were invited to participate. Uh, that included the different profiles, like technical specialists, accessibility specialists, um, course teams, uh, educational content specialists and, and I said some more researchers in different areas to cover different perspectives. So in order to understand accessibility, just some quotes just to make it simple. Uh, the case of, uh, of a colleague from UNED, if open edX is more accessible, these improvements will be implemented in other organizations that use it, even if these organizations are in countries that don't follow the legislation, because open edX has to follow US legislation, which is supposed to be strong. Uh, another colleague, for a lot of universities that don't make an online offering, this is the first time that they come out against it. So there's a number of factors that, where they might be not to have an in-house policy. How So how the experience uh, of providing, of creating courses might influence the accessibility. In this case, uh, so about openness, no? If you are fully engaged in that kind of rhetoric, fully open, you are developing content in a way that is more easily accessible generally. Therefore, if you engage MOOCs that on that level, yes, they can help to encourage accessibility. And finally, where MOOCs could be powerful is to realize having a profile uh, is the first step, but in fact, what MOOCs can do by paying attention to what's going on is to track the changes in your profile, immediate changes. So how, how uh, personalizing can help? Can help as well in terms of, of accessibility. And when uh, I bring a bit. And the final case study is about um, the interviews with learners. So in total, 15 uh, were interviewed. Most of them, uh, most of the uh, needs declared were you know, disabilities. Um, the range uh, of age between 23 and 36 and 45, and different types of educational qualification, school level qualification, uh, and bachelor's university degree, and declaring uh, full time employee, uh, disabled and able to work and retire. So, covering different, different views, different contexts. 
one of the inter interesting things in the interview was to to track the, the steps. So what was the barrier? What was your response? And what was the solution to it? So we have an example. Uh, uh, Gemma. Uh, so my not the real name. So uh, my health issues. Uh, sorry, and uh, she was uh, declaring new uh, uh, disabilities. And uh, sorry, I don't remember the first two ones what I stand for. Uh, but uh, well, so my health issues, fatigue, concentration issues, seizures, limiting screen time. Me and I can always do the whole course and set off, and I'm usually always behind and trying to catch up. Also, any that are just videos or lectures of lectures put up with a little extra info, not tracks, for example. So the response: I might future learn to play about the changes to the instructor and got a standard email, email reply and a link to an online discussion which has been closed to further comment. For edX, the university involved was happy to tell me that the course was still available and encouraged me to be sure and read other learners' responses and a lot to learn from even if there was no longer future access. What was the solution proposed? So ensuring a transcript is available for video lecturers will help a lot. edX is the best at this, at this and should be emulated. The transcript is crossed up in a window alongside the video as it plays. Not removing access to courses as soon as the deadlines have been reached, uh, or in case of future length new policy, allowing more time before it all reverts to paid access only. We are talking about 2016, something like that. So just to wrap up, so we have some time for, for some questions uh, and discussion. Uh, yeah, encouraging. Uh, the participation of stakeholders in these processes is, is very relevant. This is this literature review uh, we uh, we had with Kula and Alison. Um, it was about um, health education, but I think it applies quite a lot in terms of helping us to think about what we want to change. So we want to change the processes between organization, or we just want to focus on producing the products, so the platforms and the courses. Uh, we need to think about the, the, the co-design uh, processes and how we want to involve uh, everyone involved, uh, everyone that's going to be uh, creating and using those resources. So identify those stakeholders involved. When framing the, the problem, invite them to, to take part of different um, methods that can involve interviews and, and think about those uh, aspects that might help more in, in, uh, in design aspects, so more more code, more co-design uh, actually uh, methods that might involve brainstorming, reflecting activities, narratives, working with the scenarios, uh, using more traditional aspects such as focus groups, and as well try it, trial uh, experiment output. So think about what we are getting, and we are using an agile approach. How many times we are going to be running this process, etc. So uh, contributions to knowledge. So uh, it's quite clear we are run by legislation, and and that's what's driving accessibility. We might think about uh, how much we need to rethink and refocus uh, on on as well involving the stakeholders. When trying to find help and report accessibility, it can be complex for learners. It's something uh, that the platforms should be uh, uh, it should be kind of easier to reach out. Um, we have to realize that many barriers don't necessarily have to do with technical aspects, it might be involved with the learning design, and um, providing dynamic solutions when the courses are live is always tricky. Uh, auditing accessibility is complex, can even be more complex in education, in my opinion. Uh, results are not necessarily permanent in time and can bring false positives. Simplifying the process is complicated and not clear if it really is what we want to. Uh, different evaluators might produce different results, and we cannot really have in our uh, process uh, a line that says compliant to weaker guidelines, yes or no, because that actually doesn't work like that. So I I raise the following question uh, about your accessibility experience for designing more accessible educational platforms and resources, and let's have some talk together before to go for lunch. <laughs>